Have you ever prayed for something and felt like God was silent? Or felt like an outsider to God's activity? Have you ever watched a loved one suffer and felt helpless? Well, if you answered yes to any of those questions, you may be able to relate to the woman in today's story. Now, before we dive into the miraculous healings of Jesus story that we're going to look at together today, I do want to say that there is so much that I don't know, and I am entering into this conversation with curiosity, with doubt, with possibility, and everything in between. And I am so with you in the learning. And while today's passage speaks specifically of dramatic healing, I want to invite us to be open to the many layers of healing that might be emerging in the lines of an account like the one that we're going to explore together today. Relational healing, psychological healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, holistic healing. And like you, I am deeply aware that we live in a world with suffering, with health challenges, with relational breakdowns. And I have, as I have been preparing for this message, I have been mindful of, praying for, and holding in my heart those I know who are seeking healing in various ways in their lives. And while I don't know why sometimes healing happens and why sometimes it doesn't, I do know that I want to be open to possibility and I want to keep the door of my heart open for the miraculous. And so with all that in mind, as we continue in this series, if you have access to a Bible this morning or a Bible app, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew 15, 21 to 28. And it starts with this, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Now, for a bit of context, Jesus and his disciples were leaving the place where he had fed the 5,000, and then he got into the boat and walked on water. And as they returned that boat to the shore, people caught wind that he was around and they gathered up their sick and their sick asked for permission to touch the edge of his coat. And scripture tells us in Matthew 14, 38, that whoever touched him was healed. We see here that Jesus had developed a reputation for healing and this woman came to him in desperation because her daughter was suffering. And while we might not understand what it means to be demon-possessed, we can appreciate that this woman's daughter was tormented and nothing else worked to release her and she was suffering terribly. As Jeff Martins taught us last week, whatever we believe or don't believe about demons, it does help to understand that to the people in this time period, demons were very real. And while we might not be able to know what it's like to have a loved one uh, be tormented by a demon, we likely do know what it's like to watch someone that we love suffer and to feel helpless as we watch them suffer. And for all of us um, who are parents in the room, I think we can empathize with what this mother might have been feeling. Now, we don't know the age of the daughter, and yet as parents and caregivers, we know that regardless of the age of our child, there is nothing worse than watching your own child suffer. And maybe this mother had tried everything, and Jesus was her last hope. She would likely do anything to alleviate the suffering of her daughter, and I can only imagine how helpless she must have felt, especially knowing that in Bible times, women had so little status and social power, and she reached out to Jesus and asked for mercy, knowing perhaps that Jesus was known for mercy. Now, we also learn from these two verses that this woman is a Canaanite, She's a foreigner. She's a woman born in the territory northwest of Galilee, where the cities of Tyre and Sidon were located. And in the Gospel of Matthew, the writer calls her a Gentile. And this indicates her separateness from the Jews. So to the disciples, she was not one of them. And they felt the tension. They felt all the ways that this made them uncomfortable because You know, we just love to be with people who are like us, don't we? And she was a non-Jewish woman, 
which to them meant that she was pagan. And Matthew's Jewish audience would have understood the significance of Jesus helping this woman, and it was a really big deal. Now, because this woman had a daughter who was demon-possessed, and because she was an outsider to them, I think it's fair to say that she likely experienced what it was like um, to be marginalized and to be excluded from community. In verse 23, we read this, Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Jesus did not say a word, which is super interesting. And personally, I think I would have found this if I was there to be confusing or frustrating because this was his moment, right? So why the silence? Well, the disciples asked Jesus to get rid of the woman because she was bothering them with her persistent begging and crying. You know, maybe it caused a scene. And these disciples showed no compassion for her, no sensitivity to her needs. Because the thing is, it's possible to become so preoccupied with spiritual matters that, that we become um, oblivious to the needs around us. And then in verse 24, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus replies to the disciples with an interesting statement, telling them that he was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And I'm so curious why he would say that. And perhaps he was stating what he understood the disciples believed about him and his mission. He said these words while he was on Gentile territory on a mission to Gentile people. And it wasn't uncommon for Jesus to minister to the Gentiles as he did on so many other occasions. It's almost as if Jesus was setting the stage for upending what the Jewish disciples believed or thought they knew about Jesus. In verse 25, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, dog was a term that the Jewish people commonly applied to Gentiles because the Jews considered Gentiles to be pagan people and no more likely than dogs to receive God's blessing. Jesus was not degrading the woman by using this term. He was reflecting the Jews' attitude so that he could contrast it with his own heart attitude. Verse 27, yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. The woman did not argue. Instead, she used the same words that Jesus did, knowing how radical it would be if Jesus were to bless and heal her daughter. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. And so as I reflect on this passage, what is the lesson? What does Jesus want us to know? Well, first of all, Jesus is teaching here that faith is available to all people. This is who he is. He is inclusive. He is healer. He is restorer. Jesus came to bring wholeness. And as Jeff Martins taught us last week, he came to restore us and bring us back to our true selves, the very selves that we were created to be. And this is for all of us, even for those who may consider themselves to be outsiders. And it's through this passage that we see Jesus contrast the ways of religion to his ways. And right before this passage, the writer Matthew is teaching about how God transforms us on the inside and how it's what is happening on the inside that is more important to God than what is perceived on the outside. And all of this was radical. All of this was upside down to the disciples. The disciples knew that Jesus had come for the Jews and this Gentile woman was very much on the outside. And this healing turned everything that the disciples knew upside down. And that was the very point Jesus wanted to make. This passage is about healing, and this passage is about how there is space for all of us in the kingdom of God, for all of us to experience wholeness. And the disciples were being invited to consider that Jesus had come to bring life and hope and restoration 
to all people. There are no outsiders. And then the second piece that we learn in this passage is that healing doesn't always look the way we want it to. The reality is sometimes healing is nonlinear and not as straightforward as we would hope for. And Jesus demonstrates that in this passage through his unfolding interaction with both the disciples and with the woman. The reality, friends, is that life is complex, life is difficult, and suffering is real. And life is both deeply beautiful and deeply broken. As Duke University professor Kate Bowler has taught me, there is no cure for being human. Life is so beautiful and life is so hard. And I don't know about you, but I don't relate super well to the story of this woman who has a demon-possessed daughter. And yet maybe the question for us today is this, can you and I relate to her desperateness? In other words, is there an area in your life, in my life, where we are desperate for healing? Is there a miracle that we are holding before God, asking um, in prayer for a breakthrough? In the silence as you and I fall asleep at night and in the, in the silence as we wake up in the morning, what is consuming and occupying our thoughts and our hearts? Maybe you're coming to terms with a diagnosis for yourself or for someone you love and longing for healing. Maybe there is a relationship in your life that is breaking your heart. And while you have tried everything, you don't know what else to do and you feel stuck. Maybe you are plagued by obsessive thoughts and longing for a calm mind. Maybe you have trauma in your past that is activated when you least expect it, reminding you that there is healing work to be done. The Gentile woman's daughter was healed, but not instantly. And her healing involved more than just her. Her healing also had meaning and significance for the disciples and for those who were present to the miracle. And so the big, big idea in this passage is that healing is available for everyone, but it doesn't always make sense and it doesn't always uh, go the way that we hope. And yet each of us is invited to stay on the journey of healing by trusting the process, by trusting Jesus. And so that's the invitation for us to consider today. How can we trust Jesus even when the healing that we're longing for is not going the way that we want it to go or it's taking longer than we would like? And so what are you in need of when it comes to healing? Like the mother in this biblical account, what are you crying out to Jesus for? And maybe you don't have a demon-possessed daughter. And yet, what does trusting Jesus while you are trusting the process look like? And so, if you have been crying out for healing, if you have been crying out for physical healing, for mental health, spiritual healing, relational healing, emotional healing for yourself, for someone you love, and today, if you are in a place of waiting, if you're in a place of desperation, what can you and I do as we stay on the journey and trust Jesus? As we trust the work of Jesus in our lives, what can support us? And so as I've reflected on this, a couple of practices have come to mind. And the first is this, if Jesus is all about healing and wellness and wholeness, then how might we align ourselves with him and with his work? And what might it look like to do the inner work that healing requires? Like counseling, like taking care of our physical health, initiating relational repair, prayer, and spiritual formation. And then secondly, as we hope for and pray for healing, it's so natural to feel helpless and so aware that we are not in control. And yet what can we do? Because when we encounter suffering, it's supernatural to ask why. And I love how Richard Rohr says that we are transformed in two ways. 
He says that we are transformed through great love and through great suffering. And I definitely don't understand why it has to be this way. And yet I wonder what the opportunity might be in our suffering. In 1946, a therapist by the name of Viktor Frankl wrote a book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. He wrote this book following his experience as a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. And he writes about how when everything was taken away from him, he still had choice. He had agency. And um, by that, he means that he could still choose his response, even though he couldn't choose his situation. And this way of reframing was really powerful for him. And it opened the door for him to make meaning out of his suffering and to help others make meaning out of their suffering. He writes about how in many cases, the prisoners in the camp who survived, the ones who were able um, to make it in a sense, were the ones who were able to make meaning out of their suffering. And rather than feel sorry for themselves, they looked for ways to find purpose, to face their suffering with dignity. And so as you and I are trusting Jesus and as we are crying out for healing in our lives, we too have an invitation to make meaning, to face our pain and our suffering with dignity, which gives us agency which has the potential to pull us out of despair and self-pity as we trust in Jesus. The third practice in a world of suffering is this, how can we move toward goodness knowing that is who Jesus is? How can we be increasingly gentle with each other knowing that all of us are facing challenges and pain at any given moment? Can we together create a more gentle world in the midst of suffering? And can this be the way that we live counterculturally in resistance? Now, this is not to minimize the journey of suffering, not to minimize the journey of being human. And yet I'm wondering, how can we find the goodness of God in the lives that we actually have in the not yet? How do we make sure that we don't over-identify with our pain and suffering to the point that we miss out on the goodness and beauty of God all around us? The ordinary miracles, like the fireflies this week that have been on display in the evenings, the, the peonies and their fragrance that I cannot get enough of, the way that our feet feel barefoot in the grass, the delight um, that we see in toddlers as they eat, maybe for the very first time, fresh strawberries and the way that the sun sets at night. These are the kinds of questions that I personally am reflecting on as I want to move toward and embody goodness. Goodness has a way of healing us. And so how can we be on the lookout for goodness? And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, let's be people of prayer. People who cry out to Jesus with faith and trust like the mother that we read in this passage. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us to pray continually. And Colossians 4, 2 tells us to never give up praying. You know, an interesting practice or action step for you and I might be to search and spend time with all of the verses in scripture that instruct us to pray for healing as there are so many. Now, to be honest, as I think about prayer, so much of what I pray for um, doesn't turn out the way that I think it should, at least that I can tell. And sometimes prayers are not answered. And yet, I still wonder, how might we live in expectancy? How might we live with openness? I do not want to become cynical. I want to live my life with expectancy and to be open to possibility and to the miraculous. And I wonder if that invitation is for all of us. As some of you know, I'm currently in a placement with the spiritual care department at the St. Catherine's Hospital. And you need to know I'm so uncomfortable with hospitals and I'm so squeamish in that place. And yet this placement has been a big stretch for me. And it's also super uncomfortable because the hospital is full of suffering. And in this experience, I have come face to face with the suffering of others in ways that I could not escape. You know, in many cases, I witnessed people praying for healing 
only for a loved one to pass away. And while praying for healing and for a miracle is always the path that I want to choose, I also came to see situations where a patient passed away and their soul was made well. They knew they were loved, they expressed their love to the people that mattered to them, and they found peace with God. And I have now come to see this as really meaningful and beautiful and sacred. Now circling back to the daughter in the passage, Jesus distinguished her from being demon-possessed. He restored her to who she was created to be. He let the disciples and anyone else watching know that there are no outsiders in the kingdom of God and that his love and restoration are for all of us. And Jesus demonstrated that he can be trusted even when things go differently than we expect. And there is so much that I do not understand and there is no formula. And yet the one thing we do know is that we can trust Jesus and his heart and his commitment to make all things new. In the end, suffering does not need to define us. And in many ways, through our suffering, we can come to experience the transformative love of God and find deep meaning in the spite of our circumstances. And so as we wrap up today, I'd like to close with a benediction of sorts. May we trust the one for whom there are no outsiders. May we trust the one who holds us and loves us and only ever sees us as our true selves, defined by his love and never by our circumstances. May we never give up praying and crying out on behalf of ourselves and others. May we hold on tight to Jesus. May we keep our hearts open to possibility, open to the miraculous, aware that it may look different than what we expect. May we keep our hearts open to goodness. May we embody the healing presence of Jesus to one another. And as we close today, May we come to the table again and again. Amen.